This is sportish. Do it better. This is sportish. 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 It's the show ostensibly about sports that we started during a global sports shutdown. My name is Jeff Ralt. I'm joined by Dr. T. Shrella, the director of the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. Mike Wallace is our producer. Thanks for hanging out with us on For the Fans Network, or maybe you're catching the audio version wherever your podcasts are served. By the way, if you're listening to this podcast, we need a five-star review, uh, or a five-star rating at least, and a nice review underneath that. It would really help us out. Um, and the reason that we need to start accumulating friends, Keith, is because we have gotten quite good at accumulating enemies. Um, if you've been a fan of this show from the beginning, you know that whether it's the, the For the Fans robots uh, or who have you, we seem to engender a lot of hate. And well, we can add another enemy to the list this week, and that is your cat. Because your cat, Keith, has gone so far over the line uh, that honestly, I'm surprised that your cat is still your cat. I don't think it would have been unfair to drive them into the woods somewhere. Well, I'll be quite honest. Uh, the cat has also a penchant over the last several weeks for peeing on a particular rug in our house. too. So, so she's expressed her, her displeasure with the uh, arrangement in the Strudler household in, in a variety of ways. But uh, I will... I will preface this by, uh, you know, kind of taking the, the viewers inside, inside how, the, how the sausage gets made and, and let you know, I, I, I am in uh, the Struggler basement, which is where, you know, I, I have set up my studio. You, of course, are in the, the Brault, what I assume is the, the studio, the singular room. <laughs> the, 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 this room has one purpose and one purpose only, and it's to broadcast Sportish from. So I'm here in the basement. The only sentient being that actually experiences this show live is the cat. The cat is watching right now as we speak. The cat, the cat sits on the couch in the basement and has watched, I believe to this point, every single episode of Sportish. Uh-huh. But it seems like at some point last week, she had decided <laughs> that she had had enough. And I uh, unfortunately had left my, my Sportish mug on on the table here. Yep. That one that looks just like that. And uh, I noticed earlier in the week that she had been kind of putting her paw in the mug. She had mm. just kind of, you know, decided maybe even drinking out of the mug. There's a little water left in it, which reminded mm. me I did need to clean the mug in between, in between mm. airings. Fast forward 24 hours, Elliot, who was down in the basement playing video games, mm-hmm. yells up, he goes, dad, you're going to be angry. <laughs> so i walk down i'm just gonna have to show you this is what i found oh god it hurts to see (laughs) which just affirmed what we've always said about the show cat who doesn't seem to be a sports fan you don't have to love sports (laughs) They hate sportish. So the cat, the cat has spoken and she's spoken loudly. And I think she thinks she may have won the battle and perhaps she did. But Mia, <laughs> take this. <laughs> you have not won the war, my feline friend. So unless you're prepared to break this mug too, and I am literally speaking to you right now, cat. <laughs> and by the way, this mug is going upstairs with dad after the show. So, so yeah, she broke. This is why you had to send me two mugs, not just one. I assumed it was so I could have a, a friend drink out of it. Maybe we could have a guest on set in the show. No, it's really because <laughs> the animals who live in my house are terrorizing us. Uh, what I take away from that story um, is I'm very, very happy that your son, Elliot, knows how much you care about your sportish mugs. <laughs> that makes me very happy because I got to imagine if it's a regular run of the mill mug that fell to the floor, you just get out the broom and, and you move on with your life. Yeah. Wouldn't even wouldn't have even told me. Yeah. Or maybe not. Just left it here and, and <laughs> until things stay on the floor for quite some time in the basement. You know how that works. It, uh, so 
it's been a really crazy week since our last yeah. episode. Uh, yeah. And that is not just because of the fact that your cat has decided to swat sportish yeah. mugs off the desk. Um, let's, so we taped this show on a Monday evening, typically. That's when we're talking to you right now, the evening of uh, October 5th. Last week, we taped on Tuesday, just a few hours before the presidential debate, which went <laughs> off the rails. <laughs> and then if you thought that was going to be the nuttiest thing that happened over the last seven days, I don't think I can even keep track of it. Yeah. Turns out the Amy Coney Barrett Supreme Court uh, nomination event uh, was a super spreader event for the coronavirus. So basically everyone uh, in, our, in our national uh, executive branch is now infected with coronavirus. Coronavirus hit the NFL for the first time. Coronavirus uh, is something that people that run college football stadiums have just wholly stopped caring about. Uh, Major League Baseball has started their playoffs. The NBA Finals are now happening. And, and Keith, when you sum it all up, oh, by the way, the French Open is happening too. There's a tennis major going on right now. <laughs> and I guarantee that 80% of you just learned that for the first time. <laughs> but, I, but what's amazing, the guy who finished second in the U.S. Open played a match at the French Open basically knowing he was sick. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that as well. I didn't. No, it's, it is crazy land out there. It is absolute crazy land. So you're right. The, the, the world, apparently now, if you, you were watching after the debate, you can curse on television as well. Something we should probably stick to. Yes. Advantage of. <laughs> Chris Christie's in the hospital somewhere here in Jersey. That, like, that would have been a big story any other time. That's just an afterthought. He's, that, that's, just, that's just roadkill. That's carnage. Like, it, 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 is, it is wild. And it makes it difficult because we can't talk about anything with any sense of, uh, I don't know, uh, <laughs> like certainty uh, of, of importance. Like, we just have to, I mean, we normally ramble all the time, but this is, this is beyond the pale. But the only good thing is, who would have thought that the two of us would not have been the two most incoherent arguing white guys on television in any particular week. Right. So, so we put that on Twitter at Sportish Pod when our show premieres Wednesday. It was the day after the debate. We were like, look, we thought we were coming for the top spot <laughs> of the most disorganized conversation between two white men that would cross your television screens. And we were bumped right off that perch. Yeah. We're going to have to well, try a lot harder. We're going to, we're taking it back. You know, we're taking it back this week, you know? So, uh, and it could be some time till they, till they, till they debate again. And so it is what it is. Fortunately for the two of us, uh, coronavirus, as far as I know, has not, uh, has not touched the, the cast of Sportish. Fortunately, right. the three of us are never in the same room. Again, sure. that's, a, that's a security issue, of course, because if one of us were to go down, the other two could can, could right. keep sporters yeah. going, yeah. obviously. Yeah, it's like the designated survivor, right? At the State of the Union, somebody has to be kept at a different location. Uh, we've taken how, that to the extreme because we would, take it seriously doing this program. Yeah. How would fans feel if we both, we both fell ill and we made White Michael Wallace do the show solo? <sighs> Listen, I like Mike Wallace. <laughs> Mike Wallace brings a lot of value to what we do here. As someone who has done radio, we used to have a radio show before this podcast. As someone who's done a bit of that radio show with Mike Wallace and only Mike Wallace, I'm going to need you to stay out of uh, any high-risk <laughs> events. I'm going to need you to wear your mask when you're out in public, and I'm going to need you to stay away from any Supreme Court nominations. To be fair, to be, well, I was not invited. To be fair, uh, to be fair, Michael Wallace was thrown because I walked in and told Michael Wallace that Elliot, who's now gotten his second mention of the show, was having a seizure and I needed directions to the hospital. <laughs> That is 100% true. That is exactly what happened. Yes, 100%. But I did like the best part when I was like, hey, guys, uh, I got to go to the hospital. And you guys, okay. So, uh, so the Giants, like, <laughs> didn't miss a step. <laughs> the red light was on, Keith. <laughs> the people come to us for a reason. Um, and I don't know why people come to us in this iteration of what we do. <laughs> Um, I'm guessing it's because either you fell asleep or, or like your remote does like the down arrow doesn't work. So you're just kind of locked in. Um, you're just locked in. There's a one hour break in between poker. You got, you're just going to have to endure it to get to the other side. Uh, this was a really difficult week uh, for us to come up with things to talk about because it seems like absolutely all of the oxygen in, in, you know, all verticals of news was just sucked out by, uh, the, the, fact the, the president, president going to the coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> um, which, the, the pre <laughs> like, 
it's not funny, but it is. It's not. When, but when when you just have start having this like like a like a, a bell counter of like people, the White House staff starting with the president, like ding ding ding, <laughs> getting coming up with the vibe. Like your phone, if you have if you're like me and you have like the phone set to a tone, was it's just wild. It sounds like you're in Vegas when you're sitting in your office, and it's just it. So it is very hard to get around the first of all the craziest the craziest debate in the history. We'll just assume America. I, I, I'm sure we could go wider than that. I'm sure we could go much wider. We could get to, I mean, third world nations is where we start pushing up against it, obviously. But, but when you have that followed by, <laughs> by big parts of the, uh, the people that run the free world heading to, uh, heading to the hospital, it does get disconcerting. It's hard, to, it's, hard to, it's hard to then be like, do you think Jimmy Butler can do it again? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Uh, and no, I, I don't, even though game three was a very, a very nice showing. Uh, I, I do not think he can do it again. Uh, but that's, that is far too much of a sports-related discussion, and that is not what we will be doing here. Um, do want to talk about COVID hitting the NFL. It was not just President Trump, but nope. Patriots quarterback Cam Newton and a number of NFL players that got COVID prior to week four games. This is the first time that the virus has hit the NFL during the regular season, and we got our taste of how they're going to handle it. We saw how Major League Baseball handled it. Uh, We did not have to see how the NBA or the NHL handled it because it didn't exist inside of the bubble. Uh, Now we're seeing how the NFL handles it. And, you know, I I believe fine. Um, You know, this is if you're going to do what they're doing, which is play not in a bubble, this is what you're going to have to do. As people test positive, you're going to have to move games. uh, And they're doing that. And people are going to lose their bye weeks or whatnot. And they're going to complain. uh, But that's... That's how life is going to be in 2020. Yeah, I think you have to accept a certain amount of uncertainty with any sport that's going to play through this, particularly one that does not exist in a, you know, in a sealed bubble environment. So, look, it, it includes everything from you'll, you'll lose your bye week to you might be playing on a Tuesday and then again on a Sunday and then again on a Thursday. I mean, there, there are going to be some situations like that. It could even mean, and this will – I actually think this is going to bother people who play fantasy sports more than anything, but there may be games that just won't be played. I mean, that that's something that I know that's a very difficult thing for people to get their head around. You may have teams finishing the season, having played 14 games or 15 games. And in the end of the day, Let's be clear. If the Jets don't play out the run, I think that's going to be all right. So I do think if people can accept that level of uncertainty, you know, it's going to be interesting. You're going to get you're going to get the critiques on both sides. You're going to get the people who are going to say, how dare they not finish? You got to finish the season, right? We can't not. And then you're going to get the people on the other side who are going to say, how dare they play through coronavirus, right? And, and I think if you can accept the big fat middle, you know, assuming, look, assuming either that the, the physical toll isn't too daunting, and I mean of the virus, not of, of playing itself, but if the, if the physical toll isn't too daunting, uh, and if you can live with a certain degree of, hey, this is better than not having football at all, then I think, I mean, I think you and I are on the same page. This is what you have to do. Like, this is how it works. Yeah. And I mean, I'm on a different page with the NFL than I am with college football, right? People that are in the NFL are professionals. They are highly paid. They have far more agency to opt out than say a a college athlete does. Um, You know, I, I, I don't have so much of a problem with the NFL playing. If, if you want to go and, and play, under the protocols that the league has set forth, which I think are, are strong and I think they're good, uh, yeah. then go ahead. Um, I also think that the majority of NFL cities have done it correctly by not allowing fans uh, because I think, you know, regardless of whether that's a necessity, I think it is optically a decision that needs to be made. Yeah. Um, and that is my biggest gripe with college football's return right now is that optically it's terrible. It's not terrible. Good. That's not good. terrible. What the University of Georgia did last weekend. George, what? How could they not speak? Because what? I'll tell you what. Sloan and I were watching the game, and he literally was like, "Do they have a really small stadium?" <laughs> Can I? Because because yeah. there were these upper tier. Like, how did they let that student section turn into that? I mean, you cannot. Let's be clear. You cannot be pre med at Georgia now. You cannot believe. <laughs> you cannot believe that they're teaching science. How do you let? Because that was the most striking visual of the day, for sure. Because I was a, I was a prime time, it was a, a Saturday night game. It was the game of the day. You know, this is a, a huge rivalry. So obviously, everyone's foaming at the mouth. 
How do you let that happen? Like, I really right. don't understand. I mean, it's not like, I, I don't understand. You, you need, I, I don't understand either <laughs> because to do the gymnastics that need to be done to play, you have to act as though you are so committed to everyone's safety, whether or not you are or not, mm. leave that aside. You have to act like you are. And that everything you're doing is so buttoned up and every protocol is so stringent and it's been run through so many different checks and balances that anyone who may question your decision, you can rely upon all of this, yep. you know, planning and research and expert yep. testimony that says, hey, look, we're doing this to the best of our ability, according to all of these people. I struggle so mightily. <laughs> With, as someone who thinks you can play sports right now, right? I'm not one of those people like, you must shut it all down. I, I'm not that person. But if you're going to do it, you have to make it look like you care about doing it the right way. And if yeah. you're doing it, and I don't care if this is college sports or professional sports or whatever, if you don't look like you're doing it the right way, you're doing a tremendous disservice to the nation, yeah. to people's uh, ability to remain safe, right? Because as people see normalcy, they're going to think that we're in normal times and we aren't. As much as we don't care about the virus anymore, it still exists. It's still a risk and people need to act at least a little bit different <laughs> than, they than they usually act in order to keep themselves yeah. safe. And I think it's incumbent on people like, uh, say, a an SEC university to act right and look like you're doing the right thing, right? It's the same gripe I have with the president from Notre Dame going to the Supreme Court nomination. Like, I understand it's, it's an alumna from your university getting wait, nominated wait, wait, to the wait, highest court can we, start, can we say one of the best, one of the best mess ups of a press conference was the Rhodes Scholar. The Rhodes oh, Scholar. Yeah. <laughs> that was great when she said, uh, turns out it was Rhodes College in <laughs> just, Tennessee. <laughs> just, just a question. Uh, you said she's a Rhodes, Rhodes Scholar. I don't, I don't think that's true. First of all, you should never be getting questioned like that from a reporter. I, I think factually, she's like, what? Well, just... Oh, Rhodes College, right? And by the way, how bad does Rhodes College feel now? Like Rhodes College was just Oh, yeah, turned boy. Into, yeah, right? They were just like, turned into, they were just turned into not a Rhodes Scholar. They were, <laughs> no scholarship happens at Rhodes College. Uh, but to get back to my original point, I am so baffled at the lack of people's caring about the optics that, uh, you know, that to me, is it's not as bad as as risking people's lives or risking people getting sick but it's on the list and it's i think it's doing damage yeah and so what i don't know because obviously neither of us are in the rooms with the athletic directors and the coaches and the coaches seem to be getting better at i gotta remember to wear my mask like they seem to be even at the college level they seem to be kind of understanding a little bit more and they seem to be saying the right things um i don't know if this is if they're playing, I mean, look, some of these, some of these states are uh, overseen by fairly lax uh, governors mm -hmm. and state legislatures who might, right. I mean, I don't know who their audience is. You know, like you, you think about which public you're trying to appeal. Maybe they don't really care about, look, they don't get a huge audience. The Auburn, the Auburn, uh, Georgia game. Well, I find it highly entertaining, not huge, uh, a huge, TV property in, in Allendale, New Jersey, right? True. <laughs> Just, true. I mean, they, they don't watch right. it, right? Yeah. And Which, so, by the way, is even more reason that if you're a person in charge, that you make sure that you are looking like you're doing the right thing. But, right? I, think, but I think they're public. I don't think they're... So two things you can say about this, right? And one, one is that, that their public probably doesn't care or probably... You know, I mean, yes. They want that. I, they want that. They, they I, like I, that. No. They, I agree, so, and that, but that's my point. That's my point. I understand that they want that. If you're in a leadership position, it's incumbent on you not to pander to that. This is all how somehow you know, this thing became so politicized. Like, you need to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Because we have learned that if you have rallies in airplane hangars and giant gatherings of people and no one's wearing masks and people aren't distant, you're significantly raising your chance of testing problem. positive for the virus. It's it's right? And whatever that may mean, whether you get a little bit sick or not sick at all, or, you know, God forbid you pass away. It's incumbent on the people that are in leadership positions to I, make sure that that doesn't occur. Now, now how much, how much of this do you think is they, they just can't control it. So these kids get, and I don't know. I, mean, I, I think there's Florida, a zero I saw Florida, percent. 
I there's a zero percent chance they can't control who doesn't who comes into the stadium. No, but once it's real easy to control nobody in the stadium. It's super <laughs> no, no. easy. <laughs> that that is easier. The doors um, have locks. <laughs> So, but I'm talking about, so once you've agreed to allow a certain number of people in the stadium, how hard is it then do you think to keep them spaced out? I think, cause I think you're right. I think I didn't SMU, was it SMU that, that basically said you're not coming in? Like I, they, there was, I think there was one Texas school that, yeah. and you know, but, but how like Florida set up the actual chairs. If you looked at Florida, sure. they actually set up the chairs and, and they try to lock them down to that. But how much do you think, that they just, they tried, but in the end of the day, these kids come in and it was too much. And, and by the way, don't kid yourself. I've been, a, I've been a, a student at an SEC university. The students are pressuring to get them a little football. Like they are, Listen, you, it's intense pressure. It, it all comes down to how much you care, right? Look at any European soccer stadium in the normal times when you're allowed to have fans and look at how they keep apart the visiting fans from the rest of the fans. There is a giant line, an unbreaking line of security officers all the way down the aisle. So if you want to do it, you can do it. The problem is they don't want to do it. LSU that, that, in yeah. this upcoming game, are, they're, stopped, they're, they're no longer doing temperature checks at the gate because they say it takes too long to get into the stadium. They're upping their capacity because they believe lack of fan support in, in the stadium has led to a, a rough start to the season. I mean, Death they Valley did, is, they did lose is to Mississippi starting State. to, you know, right. Like <laughs> Death Valley's turning a little too close to, you know, not just a catchy little nickname. Uh, and this is the kind of stuff that to me is, is just, I don't know. The thing I was most wrong about in the return to play <laughs> was how much I thought people in leadership positions, whether elected officials or university provosts or, or whatever, I was most wrong about how much I thought they would care and how much they would, they would care about optics and how much they would feel obligated to do the right thing. Okay. And it turns out that basically everyone's just looking to pass the responsibility off to someone else, right? If you're yeah. a university president, you're passing it off to your governor. If you're a governor, you're passing it off to the president. And we just sort of end up with this sort of lowest common denominator in a lot of the country of, yeah, I mean, we're going to pretend like we care, but we don't. Yeah. I'm a little surprised that the college presidents are, are yeah. privileging this. I, I'm, I'm less surprised in some cases by whether it's the athletic directors, the coaches, because they are, they do want to win in empty stands. I'm sure it's a lot easier to win with, win with your students screaming and yelling. Um, yeah, it is. I, I am a little surprised. I agree. I'm a little surprised Look, Florida, I believe the, uh, the current Florida president is a uh, former provost at, from Cornell. Like these are, these are cerebral smart folks at all of those universities. Yeah. And, and I, again, I don't know whether this is a capitulation to kind of the political environment in which they exist, whether it has something to do with their, the challenge of trying to ensure that they keep enrollment on campus. So, I mean, look, some of these schools are going $100 million in the, in, in, in the red. Um, and if there's no foot, I mean, are these, these, are not, these are not acceptable excuses, but they are potentially explanations. Of course. And, I, I, you know, I wonder how much of it comes down to the fact that in a lot of ways, you know, politically and otherwise, we live in two, possibly more, different Americas with different sets of facts. And where we are up in the Northeast, think what you will about the Northeast, uh, we are getting a certain picture and we've lived through a certain history of what this virus can do. And I wonder if that picture is the same picture that they're getting in Athens, Georgia. I don't know that it is. And so we may be sitting here like, I am stunned at how these people could be making these decisions. Whereas with you know, what's permeating the culture down there, it may not be so stunning. I don't know. I haven't spent a lot of time in SEC country recently because I've been told we shouldn't move about the country. So it, to be it, fair, and pretty much anywhere you go in SEC country is going to cost you 14 days of quarantine. <laughs> right. You know? not, not pretty much everywhere, literally everywhere. So I will tell you, I mean, I miss a lot of things about life in this uh, current pandemic, uh, including the, the uh, need for space from other members of my family. Uh, I mean, there's a, lot, <laughs> there's a lot of things that I absolutely, like seeing people at work, I miss like the water cooler talk, like, hey, uh -huh. working hard, hardly working. Like, <laughs> like so this, I actually had this conversation with, uh, with my wife today, because I, I, I go to work and I'm sitting there and it's really, it's really dead, right? We're in this like, mm -hmm. hybrid things, but I'm there, I'm the school director, I, should, I need to be there, and so I'm there, you know, several days a week. And, and I called her and I'm like, oh, I'm having a 
I've had a hard time getting work done. And she's like, why? I'm like, well, you know, it's really quiet. I'm like, there's, you know, there's no one here. There's nothing to do. And she's like, sure. You're supposed, she's like, you're supposed to be working. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, what is that? But like, <laughs> like you go to work, you're like, Hey, what's up? Like, how's it going, Tom? Do you watch the Celtics lot? Like you, I need, like, you know me, I feed off that. I feed off like that kind of world. I, I mean, I gotta say, I think there's something to that. Right. I think, I think people know how to work at work in a collaborative environment with lots of people yeah. around and a, you know, a busy sort of hustle and bustle type environment. I think people have now learned how to work from home. I can honestly sympathize with how difficult it must be to work from home at work. To so when you're be, sick- be in your work environment, but essentially still be working from home, right? Zoom calls yeah. and no interactions with others. I yep. can see how that could be weird. I'm at a, a giant university, right? I've got a huge school building and I'm like, all right, the zoom's over. I'm like, uh, so now I'm just going to write that review. Right. <laughs> just gonna, <laughs> look, here we go. Right. And I'm going to do it here. Anyone, any, yeah. uh, no one, no, anyone need to see me for a meeting? <laughs> do we have any grievances, any faculty grievances I need to deal with? Like, it's nothing. And I walk, I just walk over to the Dunkin' Donuts. You know, I'm like, hey guys, what's the, I mean, there's nothing, nothing to do. So I really, but I, it is, I, I don't work well in that environment. So yes, um, getting back to that, to that kind of the, the, the issue at hand. Um, what I miss most or in some cases about, about this COVID experience is I really miss live sporting events. I know you do as well. Like I, Absolutely. and I didn't think I would, I didn't think I was going to miss it as much, but I really, really miss being able to go to, I mean, you name it, drive over to the Fordham gym or go to a Yankee stadium for an NYCFC game. Like just and not even like the big, I, like, I just want to go see, like live people playing sports other than my kids, which of course is fantastic, but it is what it is. Uh, so I really do miss that. And I, I, I understand the craving you go, you don't go to an sec school because you're like, boy, the library is really quiet on Saturdays. Yes. Like, I, right. You don't, you don't, you go there, you go there. Why people go to Alabama for football. Like it's a great 100%. school, but they go for football. I'm- I mean, heck, we went to Alabama for football, not, not for school, but we specifically were like, we need to go to a big time college football game with our old radio show. Yes. We were like, we are going to the Iron Bowl. Like, and I, I get that and I sympathize with that. And what makes me so angry about what I see on television is that it's going to make it longer before you and I get to go to those events. And it's not just sports, it's concerts, it's yeah. you know, restaurants at full capacity, whatever. It's just feeling okay being around a big group of people again. Yeah. I we're think, not going to be able to do that for a longer period of time because they're doing it now. Like, I don't know why con- yeah. America is the country Live that believes. Over. Like, it's it, over. I mean, I don't know what it is about us as a people that believe that like, because something's happened somewhere else, whether it's in a different country or a different state or a different city or whatever, that it's not, that it has no bearing on what our present actions are. And I don't understand why you think putting 30,000 people in a stadium isn't going to end poorly. It's American and, exceptionalism. Or, or at the very least, at the, <laughs> I mean, in the very best terms, why it isn't going to elevate the risk of it ending poorly. And either way, it just seems so unnecessary that it be happening. And it feels like we could all get back to not having to shout about whether we're allowed to go to football games or not on forums like this. And we could all go back to going to football games if people just – would all row the boat in the same direction. Well, it ain't going to happen. Uh, and it's, it sure it's going to be, it ain't going to happen. I mean, I mean, and then the worst part is you start like thinking like when this first happened, we're like, well, we're, we're going to have to sit out the fall and then everything's going to be fine. And we're going to be like, and, and it keeps, I keep, I keep feeling like we keep pushing this date back now. Oh, because It wasn't <laughs> even that. It was, it was, it was, it's going to be a, a, a tough go of it until Memorial Day yes. was how it started. It was going to be, it was going to be, oh man, we're going to miss the NCAA tournament. Yeah. And then it, but we'll get lacrosse just, season in. We'll be fine with yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I look, as someone who was with a, an NCAA athletics team, when this thing started, there was never, ever, 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 ever an inkling that it would impact college football season. I mean, never a thought. It was, yeah. it was shocking that it was going to impact a college baseball or a college softball season. Yeah. And, 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 and imagine, if you told, imagine if you told that basketball team, by the way, you may not start next season. <laughs> right. Right. And if you start, there's about a 50% chance you don't finish. I mean, that's, but that's the, that is what's frustrating. It's all of that. And I, I, there is something – it's not just America. I mean – Brazil ain't handle it too well either. Like yeah, we're no, not the only ones can, to screw it up. Can, look, <laughs> you can cherry pick nations like Brazil and say they're not handling it well and be yeah. absolutely correct. It's a significantly longer list of nations that are. 
And yeah, what I mean, worries we, me about those nations is anyone who can look at data, right? You're a big data guy. It's coming back there. Yeah, it does seem to be. It does. <laughs> right? I didn't like, like I mean, anyone, anyone who uh, pays attention to Israel, not, not going well. They just went on lockdown number two. Yeah. They went out on lockdown number two. And uh, it sounds like Italy's, uh, you know, getting a little nervous. It's, it's, it's not good. It's not good. But what is, so I mean, when, do we, when do we get, well, two things. When do we get to go to concerts again? I mean, well, that's a long look, way off. I got to tell you. So have you seen some of what they're doing with socially distant concerts? Yeah, but I want to get sweaty and, and bump into yeah. someone by accident. Hey. I got to tell you, <laughs> you and I have very different live music experiences because I, I, I mean, I like live music uh, quite a bit. But I'm not a huge fan of that whole like, oh, yeah. let's go get sweaty and jump around and make it like a cardiovascular experience. <laughs> I'm a big fan of like, let's relax and enjoy the show. And I got to, did you see the thing that was making rounds on social media a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago, however long it was about how they're doing concerts in England? Well, they, they, uh, is it the one where they just put these little groups together and then there's all that space? I mean, I've seen that they, where they've they're all, all space like, they're all, they're basically this big giant like festival lawn. And they're all in these own little like platforms. Yeah. They all, they're all I don't boxes. want that. Oh, I, don't I want, want that. that. I want that in the regular <laughs> times. That's, that to me is the dream way to see a concert. You know, if people, I want to be close. But here's what I, I saw the Bengals playing a toll road in Houston. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Walk like an Egyptian? Yeah, I did. That I was totally one did. of the greatest experiences. You, you have two children. That was one of the greatest experiences <laughs> well, of your life? The Rockets, the Rockets winning, as we all know, that was a, the Rockets first championship mm -hmm. number one. But mm -hmm. uh, so the, the Bengals, so they were opening up. Houston gets very excited about roads because there's so much traffic. So they opened up a brand new uh -huh. toll road and 60,000. And then and the, uh, the Bengals were going to be the band that played on the toll road to launch. Wow. And the Bengals, that's, you know, and that's, 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 that's significant. That's significant, right? And so, I mean, it's Manic Monday. It's all of it, right? And so, so, uh, so there were 60,000 people showed up for this. Now it's like a, you know, it's Houston. So it's like an eight, 10 lane road. So it's pretty wide, but uh -huh. 60,000 people goes back a long way. And we got there and I was like, we got to get to the front. And a police officer was walking his way. And I was like, get behind that guy. So we got our way all the way up to the front, right? So we were right there looking at with a Juliana Hoff, right? We were, we were right there staring at her and, and the concert's going great. We're about 45, 50 minutes in. The problem was they, they put, <laughs> they put, the, the band just so everyone for sight lines on the top of an overpass. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, 60,000 people start shaking and, and jumping. Oh. Overpass starts. <laughs> oh, we <laughs> tested the structural integrity oh, of the yeah. overpass. We, civil engineers. I saw civil engineers start to, to back up a little bit. And so, <laughs> so they did not, they had to call it after about 45 minutes, which meant no, no encore, no walk like an Egyptian. So that, so it was a great moment. I didn't get, we didn't get, you know, the, the, the coup de gras. Not long after that, I saw Cheap Trick play in a parking lot. Just if we're going to go down that road. So, but I miss, I miss <laughs> both outdoor concerts, both outdoors. Outdoor so, concerts are great. Outdoor yeah. concerts are great. So, uh, and, to, and now I find myself because there's no, you know, I'm, I'm, I find myself looking for music now and I know I'm not going to anything live and I'm sometimes embarrassed about what I listen to. Like when I'm listening to music in the car. Like today I listened to uh, Taylor Swift 15, which I'm very embarrassed. 15? <laughs> Remember that song? It's like, a, it's like about a freshman in high oh, school. Oh yeah, oh boy, that's an old <laughs> cut, sure. I mean, there's no reason to be embarrassed about Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift is a singular talent. She is, right? I shouldn't be embarrassed, you, right? You, you can make an argument that in terms of musicianship, she is one of the best of all time. I mean, look, this is a very bold statement, and it's very, very We're getting difficult. very out of our lanes here. Very out of our bit, lanes. But look, it's very, very difficult, of course, like it is in sports, to compare eras, to be like, well, Babe yeah. Ruth or Mark McGuire. Very, very hard to do that. Yeah. But honestly, there are, if you, like, I think when it's all done and dusted and written and people look back at the benefit of hindsight and it's not viewed as pop music, right? Because I think for whatever reason, pop music or anything on top 40 radio gets unfairly judged as just kind of saccharine BS. Eh, I think maybe, when- yeah. I think when you're not, when we're out of that prism, there are going to be more similarities than people like to admit between Taylor Swift and John Lennon. There really are. And I, <laughs> I understand, I, I I understand not, that reaction. I, I get it because I, mean, I understand how ridiculous it sounds. I mean, but honestly, I think when you put the cannons up next to each other, when it's all done and dusted, like, I think, I there, think are, there are going to be more similarities there than you think. I mean, I think Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band. I, I just, I think, I think the White Album. I think, 
I, 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 let me put it away. Uh, when you spin her records backwards, does it tell you that anyone is dead? <laughs> I, I will say this. I think Taylor Swift's 1989 may be the best pop album ever made. I mean, you're, 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 you're so extending yourself. First of all, you've, you've literally ignored Michael Jan- Jackson's entire no, catalog. And, and I, no, in I, fact, I was going to say, I think that it is in, it is in league with no, Michael Jackson's I thriller. I, mean, I really I look, do I, now, in terms of the best making, pop albums yeah, ever made. You're, you're, <laughs> I've said, listen, I said what I said, and I'm not just saying it because both Taylor Swift and I are from Why I'm Missing Pennsylvania. It is true, and I ride for my Why I'm Missingites. However... I really, really do think that there are similarities. And Taylor Swift gets unfairly judged, I think, because she's a pretty young girl and because she has more from a country artist to a pop artist. And because now she's you- been doing it since she was a kid, right? So to a lot of people, she's always just kind of the 15-year-old girl who has a guitar. Well, that and was good. She was great. I, I, I like that. I, I thought her country music would – I much preferred her sure. country music. Now, now and that, that just harkens back to my kind of my Texas – kind of kind of lineage and i happen to like country music but i i you've gone so far on taylor swift i I don't think it's fair to compare him to michael her to michael jackson i don't michael jackson michael jackson might be the greatest entertainer might be the greatest entertainer of of, he might be the greatest entertainer of 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 our time of all he sure might be he sure might might be be. playing to awfully similar crowds to taylor swift with oh no no i would no no michael jackson was a a far broader demographic a broader demographic i don't know that that's true that's because we are two middle-aged white guys talking about how much we're listening to taylor swift yeah i mean you're gonna make me look at my phone i mean he just come on let's let's i mean now now again michael jackson had number one hits that no one no one had ever even heard of like they were they were so like like Dirty and Diana dare, went number one. And that was a I terrible song. I guarantee you so has Taylor Swift. If we go to the Wikipedia, you're going to be like, like, I've never heard of that song. By the way, so, but my only concern is you've been so dogmatic and that's not like you. That's something I tend to do. By the way, and I want to go to the movie thing since there's literally no sports of consequence going on right now other than the not NBA all. Finals. And, the not world. and of course, and, and and of course the Major League Baseball playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> besides those <laughs> trivialities way, if you're interested in those there's plenty of options for you to hear about how they're there's, going there's another network i believe you've heard of called espn you're right so this is for the fans we're going to get into the real serious business here uh so and now i forgot kind of complete oh so but if you're going to talk about that with with uh with taylor swift i mean lady gaga is is not even close Oh no, no! Not even no. close. And and and, and 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 a star is born affirmed her grandeur. And that song, that song may be better than any song. And it brought along a hunk, a hunk of burning love of Bradley Cooper, who who knew he could <laughs> sing. Who knew? I mean, can he? Is there anything he can't do? Is there anything he cannot do? <laughs> so that Bradley, there may not be bradley cooper a proud philadelphian and as mentioned why i'm missing pennsylvania uh n- suburb sort of a suburb ki- suburb ish nearby to exurb, philadelphia. an exurb i would say yeah yes uh big uh big philadelphia eagles fan speaks well of a person big bradley cooper guy like like bradley cooper quite a bit uh that said you know lady gaga does not stack up and, against and, the against taylor and, Swift. And as long as, well, let me just complete the pop culture part of this program. Uh, we, we got into movies last week, or it was last week or the week before. They all blend together. I, yeah. You asked me what funniest movie, and I said Starsky and Hutch might be. And, and I, yeah. I, I and stick with that. No, I'm not wrong, but I and, will and, say maybe. Yes, and I maybe, do, I, do I, I, I might give me my number one. I might give me my okay. number one. Or, okay. So my number one of the moment. Before super you bad. do that, I, super I, bad, I, super it's bad. Great, it's a great movie. It's not the funniest movie of all time. It's a great movie. Um, I need to look. I was did not expect that we were going to have the funniest movie <laughs> of all time discussion last week, and I did not do a great job off the top of my head in the moment sure. with my brain rattled by the fact that you just told me that Starsky and Hutch, <laughs> featuring Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson, was the funniest movie of all time. I did not do a good job stating my case for what listing what I thought were movies that are funnier than that. Now I did a very good job. I, mean, I went to Caddyshack and I went to some really, you know, very funny movies in the, in the Canon. Um, it, look, animal house, probably number it's one. It's a funny movie. It's a funny movie. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's the a, funniest movie of all time. That's, but a, that's now, a cliche look, in answer. In an odd way, in an odd way, we're having answer. the same d- discussion that we just had about you telling me that there's no way that Taylor Swift could be as popular as Michael Jackson or as we're as having John it reverse we're having it reverse we're having it reverse because now i'm here saying it's animal house look at the history nothing will ever hold a candle or something like that you're like super bad <laughs> super bad's a funny funny it's a great the, movie the it's mclovin movie. the mclovin id scene yeah. is unbelievable when michael Cera starts singing uh those eyes i i mean that is one of the best scenes of all time 
super bad super bad is a product of the era though in which it was created right it was in the the era of the wedding crashers and the forgetting sarah marshall oh, and better. the old way schools better. of the world and i don't think it is i mean it's it's in that league and those are all really funny movies but i think you know it, it's just it's i might it's watch not... it tonight i might literally go because i might literally go and watch it tonight there's no end great to movie launched the career of emma stone helped launch the career of Jonah Hill. Like people forget the, the, the depth of talent that was in that movie. And it is great, but it is a bridge too far to say that it is the best of all time. At least with the Taylor Swift argument, I said, when it's all said and done, I think people will look back on it as, you just jump right out and say, right now, in this moment, super bad is the best, well, super, the super funniest movie of all a, time. Not Everything in the past, go too. be damned. <laughs> It's not going to be a second. Taylor Swift is not finished. She can add to the collection. I don't think we're screaming. It would be very awkward for the two of them to get back together to make another movie of that same genre. Uh, Are we going to? We've got a few minutes way, to talk about sports. Are we not going to do that? We're just we will. But you would ask me when do I think concerts are going to come back? I'm going to ask you when do you think movie theaters are going to come back? Oh no, no, the, no. So Re, uh, was it Regis uh, Regal? Uh, just, Regal. Uh, I read that. Just, yeah, they just eliminated 40,000 jobs. AMC, are they on the block for Amazon? Who I've, I've, There's some room. Amazon might get into this guy. I don't want to go too deep into the, in the weeds because it's kind of what, what we do at my school. But, the, uh, but um, there is, there's a chance. Look, I do think some of these large venues will be preserved for the, you know, for the, the 3D films, for the Marvels. I think that will find a way to continue, particularly in large cities. Everything. There is no more date movie that, mm. that that's dead. There is a chance. So there was a rumor that a company like Amazon, which will take over the world. And I'm, you and I are completely comfortable with that. I'm, you know, that, that works for us. Uh, as long as they keep the shipping, you know, free, free and, and, and overnight, keep it coming. So their robots turn my lights on and off. So we really need them to stay afloat. <laughs> so they, there is a chance they might buy into that. They can use that to launch some of the series that then they'll be putting on. So they might use that to, put a, the first couple of episodes of something that will lent, that later air mm. on Prime, or they might get mm. may, a little bit more pronounced into the movie business because Amazon can, can have a very different business model than anyone else. And you know, they can use yeah. that, I wouldn't say a lost leader, but it can certainly amortize other parts mm -hmm. of their business. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think, but you're not, who, who's risking it for, I understand risking it for, for a Georgia Auburn. Like we might even be like, yeah, it's kind of worth it. Who's risking it to go see something you're going to see on a big screen TV I, in a week? I, listen, I think there are people, I think there are types of people that are the same type of person that gets, ex you know, a certain type of person gets excited to go see Georgia Auburn in the stands. I think there's a certain type of people that get just as excited to go see the new Marvel movie the day that it comes out. So I don't think it's a great leap to think that those are, are uh, I don't think it's wildly as, different. I don't think it's as many. It's certainly, if you're looking at the, the challenge, what a tenant's trying to make this work and it hasn't worked. And so- I don't know. I think I, I, this is actually a very interesting debate. I think more people are fanatical about Marvel movies than are fanatical about college football. That's a good, we're going to have to yeah. dig into that. One. We're going to have to dig into that. <laughs> well, yeah. I think you're right. Because college football will, but now not football. I don't, if we extend that to football- yeah, uh, the, okay, the we're fanatical gonna to... part is what gets interesting, right? Because there's a lot of people that like football that absolutely dislike the live football viewing. We got to look at the gross. We got to look at a first weekend gross of these movies. They're pulling in a lot of money, but so we got to look at I a mean, first weekend and, gross. And look, we also got to think internationally here because outside well, of the sure. borders of America, don't nobody care about football. <laughs> Uh, should we end on a sports a sports topic? Uh, we might as well. Why start we now? Might. <laughs> we might. Why? Well, look, we emphasize the ish in this episode, right? <laughs> we we have been very honest from the start yeah. that there are going to be. Mama said there'd be days like this, <laughs> where where we just don't want anything to do with whatever might be happening. Right? No. Um, one thing we did sport and I look. We'll finish by getting back to maybe the most sports discussion that we've ever had on this program. Last week we started wondering where does LeBron James making nine of ten consecutive NBA Finals rank among the greatest sporting accomplishments of all time? Um, the Minnesota Twins are adding to that list, and this was happening last week, and and it had slipped my mind, or I hadn't you know internalized it. The Minnesota Twins, who are out of the Major League Baseball playoffs, they went two in a barbecue, lost their only two games. Um, of the play in round or whatever the heck they're calling it. Uh, they have now lost Keith 18 yeah. consecutive playoff games. I got to tell you that might be on my list yeah. of most impressive sporting streaks I've ever heard about.
So it's, a, I mean, so, you know, it's a statistical anomaly. If not, I mean, if you flip a it's coin, mind blowing. Like, you figure once you're in the playoffs and I feel like I'm talking to my cat, like, don't you get near this mug? <laughs> Don't you look at me. <laughs> I got a few more minutes of the show and I'm taking this mug upstairs. <laughs> you see, you don't have a live studio audience. I have a live studio audience. So, true. so you figure once two teams make it into the playoffs, it, look, it's, one team is probably better than the other, but it's not that far from a 50-50. You'd have to assume these are two teams yes, that have, I agree. right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. why, you know, and even in the most lopsided of, 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 of basketball series, the, the, the eight seed is going to pick off a game just because mm-hmm. – and basketball is a, is a sport where the better team always wins, right? And so you would think you have a good pitcher, right? I mean, at some point. So if you fl- – I don't know what the numbers are, and we, I, I could calculate it. If you flipped a coin 18 times in a row and oh, got man. a heads, I mean, yeah. you, that you could retire with your – and have your family retire. If you put, you know, $100 on that, you're, yeah. You're, you're, yeah. you're good for life. I, I read a, something – crazy. I think I read something where if you started with a dollar, if you bet a dollar on the Twins to lose the first of the 18 playoff games and let it ride for them to lose on the next 17, yeah. you'd have like $1.5 million. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> but I mean, it's especially unbelievable to me in baseball because baseball is the ultimate anything can happen in a yeah. small sample size yeah. sport. It's just, it's the sport where, you know, individual talent, in my opinion, matters the least. Uh, because you just know one person has as much impact on the game as I think they do in the other major sports. And the fact that the twins have just not, just not had the ball bounce their way uh, once yeah. in their last 18 tries. It's mind blowing. And I would think exactly. I would think, yeah, pitcher has a bad night. I would also think you'd have an ACE that at some point, at some point you're like, our ACE is on the mount. He's going and they to had, win. They had, they had Johan Santana. <laughs> I don't know if they got into the playoffs much in the Santana years, but they had him. How, how much pressure are you feeling when you get when, I mean, <laughs> you get up there? How disheartening is it for the fans? Because you know, well, you know as, you're going to lose. Look, as streaks build, the pressure comes because you start thinking in terms of these monumental yeah. numbers and you start yep. thinking of historical place and it just gets into people's mind. And this is going to be important for us as we wrap up this episode because, Keith, we've got almost six months without missing a week. And, and I do think that as we get closer to episode 30 and our six-month mark, are we going to start feeling the pressure mount to keep our streak alive? It's, it's entirely possible. The good, the good news is I've got nothing else to do. <laughs> so really, just turn on the lights and let's go. As, as of now, we're planning to be back with you next week. Will we be? <laughs> Tune in to find out. For our producer, Mike Wallace and Dr. Keith Strudler, my name is Jeff Brawl. Thanks so much for coming along for another episode of Sportish. You can catch our archives on demand at ftfnext.com, and our podcasts are always available wherever they're served. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Sportish. See you next time.